Hi, I'm Michelle Chalfant, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life's challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. So welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast, Gabrielle. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh my gosh. I was just chatting with you saying you are so in line with living your adult chair. (laughs) I'm so so happy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so, so, so very happy to have you today because you have gone through so much in your life. And I'm looking forward to really hearing or you sharing with the audience your story and how you got to be where you are today. So I know you have this incredible freaking story. So I do. I I mean, I think it, I I think it's incredible because I've lived it, but Mm -hmm. I I like to think that my ass got promptly kicked into the adult chair. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It it wasn't like a slow, gradual sit down, Um, but I was married for almost two years, Mm -hmm. found out my husband was having an affair with a 19 year old for six months, Mm -hmm. filed for divorce and left. Shortly after that, I met a guy and we fell madly in love with each other, had this whirlwind romance, like meet my family, have my babies, all the fairy tale nonsense. Wow. And he convinced me to join him on a month long trip to Italy. Mm -hmm. 48 hours before we were getting on the plane, he told me he needed to go by himself. And I was absolutely devastated, broke my heart like my ex-husband never could have done. But as I was sitting on my bed in a pool of tears with a bottle of wine, I had a decision to make. And that was either stay at home heartbroken or go travel Europe for a month by myself. So I took a backpack and did six countries over the span of a month. And I wrote my book, Eat, Pray, FML about it. Wow. You wrote the whole book in a month. (laughs) I wrote, so I took a leather bound journal on the trip with me and I wrote by hand in that. And I wrote three fourths of the book on the trip and then finished it when I came home. Wow. Okay. So you were married. Wait, how long did you say you were married for? Almost two years. We were together for five um, and engaged for two and married for almost two. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you find out that he's been cheating on you. Yes. And the marriage. And then you meet this other guy like soon thereafter, correct? Yeah. So I had, we had been unhappy, my ex-husband and I, for roughly six or seven months. I Mm -hmm. didn't understand why we were going to therapy. I was working really hard to try and get us back to a place of love and happiness. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't working. It was like banging my head up against a wall. And I felt like he wasn't trying. And when I found out about the depth of the affair, I mean, he had a second phone and there was like hotel receipts. Like it was so deep. Um, I I originally wasn't even going to include the details of that in the book because it's really just the first couple chapters that sets the stage for this crazy journey that I go on. Yeah. And one of my girlfriends was like, no, Gabrielle, that was like an episode of CSI. You have to tell people how you found out. So I went back and wrote about it. But I had been, you know, miserable in my marriage for a solid six or seven months. And Mm -hmm. when I found out about everything, he was away on a work trip. So I had filed for divorce. I knew that this was coming when he came home, that I was going to serve him the divorce papers. Mm -hmm. And that had been happening for roughly two weeks um, until he came home and I was able to Mm. serve him the papers. Like once I found out about the cheating and then I met the next man two weeks after that. So it was about a month after I knew I was filing for divorce and six months, seven months of being miserable. I was going to ask you, what was that like when you found out? I mean, was there... I'm wondering what your mindset was like, because I can only imagine finding out that my husband was cheating on me in that way, like so soon after being married. So what was that like for you? You know, because I had been unhappy for Mm -hmm. such, uh, for so, so many months and, you know, through my healing journey after I, I did come to find that 
I, I loved him, but I was never really in love with him. Mm-hmm. And I had married him because he was safe. I come from a long line of abandonment issues. My, my father tragically passed when I was six years old. I walked in and found mm. him on the floor. Oh um, my God. I then lost my high school sweetheart when I was 18 in a car accident. So I have a whole history of abandonment and fear of abandonment and fear of being alone. So I I married him because he was safe. Obviously, I didn't Mm. know that consciously at the time. But when I found out about all the cheating, it was really, I I wasn't heartbroken. And I was really Mm -hmm. thankful for that. I, I felt betrayed and I felt rage to this person who had disrespected this commitment we had made to each other, disrespected my body in such a volatile way, you know, there's nothing yeah. like finding out that your husband was having sex with someone other than you and then coming home in the same 24 hour period and sleeping with you and realizing that you have to go get tested now because God knows where she or sure she was else, yeah. where else he has been. Um, so it was a lot of betrayal, a lot of rage. Um, but there was no heartbreak. And I think I attribute that to why I was able to kind of look at it as a blessing in disguise. And really, I felt like I was getting a second chance at being happy in my life. And I, you know, not to say that you need someone to cheat in order to leave a marriage, but I would have stayed a lot longer trying to make it work and doing therapy and being like, Mm -hmm. I made this commitment. We just had this big wedding. I would have stayed a lot longer than I should have because of that. So meeting that other guy was a blessing in disguise almost because it, he really helped you then probably I'm guessing with your healing process. Um, I mean, yeah, like- the, the man I met after his name is Javier in the book for, for character purposes. And mm-hmm. I really, that relationship was the catalyst to so much of my healing. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish I could say he was a rebound. It would have made my life so much easier. Um, mm-hmm. But I, we fell hard and fast for each other. And that, that relationship was really what pushed me to go heal a lot of this abandonment stuff. You know, I'm mm-hmm. a huge believer in everything happens for a reason. Sometimes you me can't too. see it until you're on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. But even when I found out that I was going to be taking this trip alone, and how devastated and heartbroken I was, it all made sense. It was the universe delivering a clear way for me to go face all the abandonment shit head on Mm. and be like, well, you're going to go across the world and figure out how to be alone and figure out how to love yourself. And it's happening right now. Wow. So, so that was it for that second guy. Like once that ended, once you left the country, no more with him. Like you didn't date him. Oh no, he's throughout. He, unfortunately he's throughout the entire book and in the sequel. So there's a long, a long twisty road with, uh, with that one. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So you talk a lot about abandonment and I've also heard you talk about trauma and healing trauma. Is your abandonment, the trauma that you're speaking of, or is there something different? Was there other trauma? I mean, I think we all pick up so much different trauma throughout Mm -hmm. our life. It's like gathering eggs in a Easter basket and you're just like deciding when you're going to start dropping them off throughout your life. Um, But for me, yeah, I think the trauma was, it it was locked in my six-year-old little self Mm -hmm. when I walked in and found my dad. And that trauma was then reinforced when I lost my high school sweetheart because at the basis of fear of abandonment for me, it was when I love someone, they die. So my dad was the first person, obviously man that I loved and he died. And then my high school sweetheart was the first kind of like puppy love that I had and he died. So it was really this, when I love someone, they die Mm -hmm. pattern that was repeating for me. So then I married my ex-husband because I wasn't fully in love with him and he was safe. And that meant he wouldn't die. And of course, I didn't realize this when I was walking down the aisle at my wedding, but I did definitely realize it on my healing journey afterwards. And so that for me has been the biggest trauma and belief to kind of redefine and work through in my life. Yeah. How, now, how did you discover this? I mean, what was your healing journey? Like, cause this, these were some big big giant things that happened to you with your husband. And then this guy leaving you right when you're about to leave for going out of country. What was this? Talk about your healing. Like how would someone heal from this? Cause I'm thinking about our audience. Like there's a lot of trauma. I mean, there's a lot of trauma in the world, but you know, as women, let's just face it, you know, there's a lot of trauma in the world, but as women, 
you know, I hear these stories similar to yours, or I had trauma and then I attracted this guy, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, like how we attract different people. But yeah, what is your, um, talk about that journey. Like, how did you discover like, gosh, you know, I think I'm creating this for myself, or I think this is happening because I've got wounding. And then what did you do about it? Like, did you go to therapy? Like, talk about that. Yeah. So I know everybody's like, well, I can't just hop on a plane and go to Europe. Um, right. Right. Luckily I only had, you know, 48 hours <laughs> to make that decision and everything was already booked. So I was like, well, I guess I'm going. Um, and I had sold my wedding ring to pay for the trip. Um, cause I didn't want him paying for any of it. Um, so it was kind of already like, I, I guess this is what we're doing. This is what the universe is guiding me to go do. Yeah. So I, I knew that I needed to figure out how to be alone and be okay by myself. And I knew that I needed to figure out how to love myself. And, mm. you know, self-love is this weird concept that people think they have to look in the mirror and be like, I love you, Gabrielle. You're so wonderful. And every time mm -hmm. I do that, I feel freaking crazy. I mean, more power <laughs> to you if you can, but like it just yeah. never worked for me. Um, it felt really inauthentic. So I knew that I was searching for these two things, the Europe trip itself, you know, I, the therapy for me on that trip was, was writing the book. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something very therapeutic about physically writing in, in a journal, as opposed to typing where it, it comes out of your body onto yep. the page. And there were days where I would stay in the, in the, the hostel that I was at and cry for five hours and write. Mm. Um, and it not, you know, party or go out and s see the sites or do anything. So it was, it was a very interesting journey for me because there was a mix of meeting these incredible people really like going out and finding out who I was as an individual, not in a relationship because I'm a serial monogamous. So I've always been in relationships, mm -hmm. um, spending time alone by myself and actually realizing that I really enjoy it. Mm. And, you know, writing and really giving myself that therapy and allowing myself to cry and allowing myself to be sad and letting my heart feel all the different things that it was feeling. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when I came back, I, I, I'm a big advocate of therapy, even when nothing's wrong, like right. go to therapy, um, mm -hmm. go talk about your stuff. Um, and, you know, so of course I jumped into that, but the, the Europe trip really showed me how capable I was on my own, you know, yeah. and how much I really enjoyed being alone and the power it co that comes with being alone. Mm. And I kept searching for this mythical self-love thing and I didn't fully figure it out until I came home, which is why I write about it in the epilogue of Eat, Pray, FML. And I came home and, you know, this whirlwind of stuff that had happened because from the time I found out about the cheating, filed for divorce, fell in love, got my heart broken and came back from Europe. Mm -hmm. That was all in a three and a half month period. Like it was wow. wild. Oh it, my it, gosh. My, my <laughs> friends were calling me saying, we just wanted to know what's going on in the Netflix episode that has become your life. Um, what's happening this week. And so I came home and everything just stopped. And it was like, oh, now you're 28 at the time back living at your mom's house, mm -hmm. divorced already before you're 30. And I fell into a really, really big depression because there was no traveling around Europe and mm -hmm. meeting different people and writing and there, all of that stopped. So I was so depressed and, you know, I've had depression on and off throughout my life, but this was a new level and that frightened me. Yeah. And I just wanted to sit in it and stay in bed. And I needed a way to pull myself out of that. So I got up one day and wrote a list down of things that I could give myself that made me happy. Um, things that I knew in the past had really made me feel better and made me happy. And my list was like writing, meditating, creating, eating well, going to the gym, dancing. And I put that list on my mirror and I was like, okay, you have to give yourself one thing on this list every single day. And then you've earned getting back in bed and binge watching a TV show and being sad. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a week. And then it was like, okay, two things on that list every single day. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to three things, I didn't want to get back in bed. I wanted to wow. continue going out and, and doing things throughout my day. And the more you do this, you can add in more of those ingredients from your list. And 
without even realizing it, you're feeling better. And it's because you're loving yourself. And when I realized that loving yourself is as simple as giving your soul the things it loves, it totally changed everything for me. So I call it the self-love cocktail because obviously I have to relate it to, you know, a fancy cocktail or a glass of wine. Right, and right. it's something that is easy for people to do every day. And mm -hmm. if you think of it, when you're trying to show love to, you know, your mother or a, a significant other or a friend or a sister, you do things that make them experience love. Yeah. So when we're talking about self-love, why would you not do that for yourself and give those things to yourself? Mm -hmm. I love that. I have to tell you, I love hearing you say, you started out by saying I had to spend time alone and really get to know myself. And, and, and you're yeah. so right. You know, the word or the phrase you need to learn how to love yourself gets thrown around all the time. And one thing we do here, like with the adult chairs, I teach people how to do that, but I like, really like some of your ideas. But what I've learned as well is we don't take enough time, like downtime to get to know who we are. I mean, you were right. forced, you were forced into it, right? Like, well, in a way, like you went to Europe, yeah. but you got to know yourself. I love this idea though, of writing a list of things that you love and picking one a day. So yeah. it sounds like you dug your way out of depression. Oh, completely. On like your I own. Like pulled on myself your own. out of it. And that was my answer on how to love yourself. And it was like, okay, self-love cocktail every day. Yeah. And for me, it was now something that was tangible mm -hmm. that I could do and practice and show up for myself every day. Um, cause before it was like, you know, go learn how to love yourself. You got to learn how to love yourself. Loving right. yourself is the most how? important thing. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm ready to do that. Can anyone tell me how? And nobody had an answer. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right. Um, and this, this really not only pulled me out of that depression, but really changed my life. And so many of my readers live by it now. And it's, it's something that's so simple and so easy. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as your list doesn't involve outside sources. It has to be things that you yep. and only you can give yourself that you love. I have a question about that. So, um, cause I, I talk about this when I'm working with people that are codependent or that really don't know who they are, let's say their, their identity is based on outside of themselves. And I'll say, what do you like, or even, or what do you love or even like about yourself? Like what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite thing for dinner? And I mean, I can't tell you the number of people that are like, I have no idea. Wow. I don't even know. Like I've spent so much time taking care of kids, making sure my husband's okay, making sure my wife's okay. I don't even know what's going on inside of myself. So I love this. Did you have a hard time coming up with things on your list? I'm just curious. Like, did it take a little bit for you to come up with a list of things that you love? It, it did because I was in such a dark place when I started mm -hmm. trying to do this. Um, yeah. so I, I almost had to be like, okay, what, when I wasn't feeling like this, what did I do that made me feel happy? Obviously I'm not one of those crazy people that loves to go to the gym and like be yeah. dying and dripping in sweat, but I know <laughs> that the end result makes me feel better mentally. So that was on my list. Yeah. Um, I knew, I know from, you know, just being growing up in a house with my mother, um, who is a healer, knowing that meditating and doing breath work can really help center you and mm -hmm. bring a lot of good stuff to your cellular levels. Um, so that was on my list. Dancing has always been my biggest joy going out and, and being able to just move to music. So that was on my list. Things that, that really like set your soul on fire or make you feel so much mentally better. I love that. I love this. And then the other thing that you said, which I really, I preach this one. Let me just tell you, we have to learn how to sit within ourselves and feel our emotions. Yes. Yeah. So did, did you do that before all of this went down or is this something new that you started practicing during your healing throughout your healing? Um, that's a good question. I think I, I know I definitely did it on my trip. There were days where it was just like, I have to sit and feel this. And then I'm going to write about what I'm feeling and try and figure out why I'm feeling it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I did that as much before. I think this was probably the catalyst that really made me be introspective and kind of play detective with myself and be like, why are we feeling this? I, I talk about something in the book called a thought onion, and it's kind of like my technique to 
look at your thoughts and your reactions and figure out what's underneath them and what's causing them. Mm-hmm. So you look at it like an onion and mm-hmm. the first mm-hmm. layer is the superficial thought. And that's kind of like your knee jerk reaction when something happens before you can even, yeah. you know, take the words back into your mouth. Like it's the initial thought that comes. And when you peel that layer back, you get to the authentic thought. And the authentic thought is the emotion that's living within you that's causing that reaction. Mm. Um, so it's a little bit deeper of a, of a level of why you would be having that initial reaction in the first place. And then when you peel that layer back, you get to the subconscious thought. And that's mm. where the real like golden nuggets are. Mm-hmm. It's usually a long stem trauma or a belief you've been carrying for a long time, often subconscious. And when you can get to that layer and discover what that thought is, you can then start to heal, adjust, and fix things to have different thoughts and reactions in the future. Oh, I love that. Are you, are you I was journaling always, this? Yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, w- you know, I was always going to change. I was always going to change the name. I came up with it on my, my first day alone in London. Yeah. And was like, God, I have to change the name. That's so lame. And then I just kept writing thought onions throughout my trip. I was like, well, I guess it's stuck. <laughs> no, I love thought onions. I think that's awesome. Don't change that for sure. <laughs> um, you are someone, as I listen to you and I'm like, God, you're so resilient. Like, Thank you. Has this been who you've been your whole life? Or is this something that you sort of, you became a more, a more, how do I say this? You became a more resilient person because of this experience or what were you like before this? Cause I'm thinking again about people listening, going that's, you know, you're an optimist, you know, you just bounced right out of this, but I don't think you bounced right out of this Oh There's no healing process, but well, yeah, no, you, this you had a mindset sh- shift, a mindset shift. Like, tell us about that a little bit. No, I mean, look, I still think that there's still things that happen to me that I go through and can't pull myself out of right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I try and be as optimistic as possible. And I do firmly believe that everything happens for a reason that doesn't make it easy or fun. Totally. Um, 2017 was by far the hardest year in my life. Um, And that's after having two major deaths happen. Um, So I was really in the thick of it and it took me a while to, to recover from it. Um, I mean, I wrote two books on it, so it's, it's, it's been a lot, but I think my first experience with resiliency and seeing how we are going to handle things that explode in our life was when my dad, when my dad died, um, my mom was shooting a movie in New Zealand at the time. So I was at home with my dad and my nanny who was, was like our, our live in, you know, mm-hmm. very dear family mm-hmm. member at this point. And I walked in, found him on the floor, ran to go get her, um, thought he had passed out because I'm like, you know, six at the time. It doesn't occur to me that he's dead. Yeah. And Obviously my mom gets the call in New Zealand, which is a 24 hour plane ride away. Um, God bless Peter Jackson, who was the director of that film and was like, D just go home and take care of your family. And we'll, we'll figure it out when you can come back. So she got on a plane, flew across the world, had his celebration of life, got all of their affairs in order, took me and my nanny got back on a plane a week later and went back and finished the film. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that was my example of like, when stuff blows up in your life, this is how you handle it. Like you push mm-hmm. through mm-hmm. and you, you're a badass and you figure it out. Yeah. Um, and I've done my best to uphold that and live, live that way. Um, mm-hmm. she also throughout my life, as I, you know, kind of grieved that death that happened, taught me that you eventually, when something happens, get to a road where there's a fork and you can go right and decide that you want to be the victim and allow this to continue to be your story mm-hmm. that you play into the victimhood of, or you can go left and be like, okay, this is something that happened to me and it's part of my story, but it's not going to define me and I'm going to be stronger because mm-hmm. of it. Um, and because of my mom teaching me that I, no matter what comes, it's like, well, we're making a hard left at some point. (laughs) And it really is about what you're choosing. I, I really agree with you there because we can either choose this or this. And I think so many people fall into, and this is not a judgment of anybody, but 
we tend to fall into almost like unconsciously dropping into that victim chair. It's where we just fall into victim and we don't even know it. So yeah. I like what you're saying, because, um, again, it's, we get to choose, do I want this or do I want that? And it doesn't sound like you just abandoned your feelings, your grief, or, and, I mean, you did your work girl. I mean, it's obvious, but you went through it beautifully. I hear someone when I listen to you, that's, um, really balanced. You make really powerful life choices for yourself, but also you went through your grief, you did your inner work. So it's yeah. both, you know? Yeah. And I, I think, thank you for that. Yeah. And I think, I think you have to walk through it regardless of if you're falling through it or if you're crawling through it or if you're running through it, but you have to go through it yeah. in order to really do the work and heal. Um, you mentioned something earlier that is so important because you have to be brutally honest with yourself mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of times I talk about this on my, my show FML talk where, you know, if something's happening in your life, especially if it's a pattern, you're attracting that in some yeah. way, shape or form, whether it's to heal something of your own, um, yeah. or learn a lesson. But so many times I get DMS from my readers saying like, Oh, well, you know, I have such bad luck in relationships and I keep attracting these shitty men. And it's like, yeah, but you have to turn around and be like, what in me is mm -hmm. attracting these people? So yes. I'm a prime example of that. Um, I, my whole thing was fear of abandonment, learn how to heal your fear of abandonment. So I attracted my ex-husband who, I mean, would abandon me in the worst grimy, awful way possible. And the universe was like, okay, did we learn that lesson? And I said, no universe, not yet. <laughs> Let's do it again. Not, we're not there yet. Let's run it back. <laughs> yeah. And, one more time. <laughs> and then I attracted the man after that, who quite yeah. literally abandoned me two days before we were getting on a flight to Europe that he invited me on. The, I mean, that's abandonment to a T and the universe was like, hello, Gabrielle, are we now ready to go <laughs> finally heal this? And I was like, yeah, all right, fine. But it, I, that was my wound that was attracting these people into my life to be able to go heal that. And I have mm -hmm. to own that. And I have to acknowledge that in order to, to, to heal it and shift it and to start attracting different people in the future. Um, which you did, I think I did. Cause I, I have watched you on social media. Yeah. <laughs> Very fine looking young man, I might add. <laughs> He's not too hard on the eyes. And you know what? So once I released Eat Pray FML, even before it really took off to where it's at now, everyone that read it was like, what happened after Europe? Like, I have to know. Yeah. Did do yeah. you still talk to Javier? Did the person you met in Barcelona fly out to see you? Like, what happened after Europe? So I always knew that I was, you know, people wanted me to do a sequel to it. Yeah. Um, so I ended up releasing the second book in September. It's called the ridiculous misadventures of a single girl. And it's a direct sequel to yeah. eat pray FML. And in that book, you see me meet the person that I'm currently with now, the crazy, mm. crazy roller coaster that we went on to get to where we are. Cause I still had so much healing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a prime example of when you heal your bullshit what you can attract in the future and how beautiful it can look on the other side. And I really want to make note and highlight the fact that you're not saying that you judged anybody, you know, and you're not blaming anybody because I think that, I, cause I've, I've shared the same thing with people. Like when you keep attracting the same kind of people into your life, you have to look inward and people go, should I blame myself? Am I judging myself for this? No, it's just raising your awareness around why do I keep attracting in partners that are abandoning me, cheating on me, leaving, you know, whatever it might be. We yeah. need to look inside and say, what wound do we have that is attracting this? Like why this is a gift for me, but people get sometimes like, what do you mean? It's a gift. It is. It's like, yeah. it's, it's showing me a part of myself that needs to be healed. Yeah. And, and it's never fun to look at that. You're never no, like, Oh, great. It's, no. it's me. <laughs> We'd rather and, blame someone else and say, well, it's them. It's like, it, yeah, but I attracted it. Like there's something yeah, in me. 100%. And I don't think that that absolves people of being shitty by any means. Um, right. my, my ex-husband 
is a piece of work and continually um, with my success tries to hurt me and bring that down. Mm -hmm. Um, Still, I don't have room for hate for him. Mm -hmm. Um, He is just a character in my story. I am so thankful for both of those relationships that happened for what they taught me for not being in them anymore. It changed my life and Mm -hmm. I would do my marriage and the heartbreak after 10 times over to end up where I am now, both Mm. personally and professionally being able to help all these people all over the world with this, this book that came out of the darkest year of my life. Mm. So beautiful. What, what do you hope that people take away from, from this book? Well, I know you have two books, but the first book, let's talk about the first book. I think both books, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, I I, I think, I think they come into people's lives at the perfect time. I've had people message me that was like, I bought this five months ago and it was sitting Mm -hmm. on my nightstand and I finally picked it up. And like, if I read it any other time than right now, it wouldn't have been what I needed. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the messages I get daily from people all over the world, which is so wild to me, um, that it has such a reach, you know, about, I was able to leave an abusive relationship because of this book, or I fought for my marriage because of this book, or I learned how to love myself because of this Mm. book. So many, so many different things because like heartbreak and grief is universal and we are all going to go through it at some point. Mm -hmm. And what I'm so thankful about this book is that I wrote it as a therapy for myself and a way to heal So it's written like a fun Netflix show. Like you Mm -hmm. sit down and you read it and it feels like you're traveling across Europe and like hearing all of this with a glass of wine with your girlfriend. But because I'm doing so much work on myself and discovering so much about myself and putting that on the page, when people read it, they have such deep realizations about things that resonate with them. So it's really this self-help book that doesn't feel like a self-help in your Facebook. Um, But I really... I hope people get whatever they need from it. You know, if that's strength to move forward or strength to leave or insight on things that might be unhealed from their past, I I think it has a way of really resonating and bringing out things in people that they're needing at that time in their life. Yeah. I think it gives people a lot of hope that, yeah you can change, anybody can change. And it is a matter of choice. And when we hear someone else's story, it does, it lands on us. It lands on each person in a different way. And um, yeah, well, thank you so much for writing both books. Thank both you. Books. Yeah. I mean, your story is incredible. Thank you so, so much for being on today. Tell us where can people find you? So I'm on Instagram at Gabrielle Stone and TikTok at Gabrielle underscore Stone. Mm -hmm. And the books are exclusively on Amazon. The first one is Eat, Pray, FML. The second one is The Ridiculous Misadventures of a Single Girl. They're on Amazon in audiobook, ebook, hardcover, paperback. um, And I narrate both the audiobooks. And they're also (laughs) signed on my website, which is eatprayfml.com. I also have a self-love healing journal that just came out. That's kind of like a step-by-step way to unpack some of your trauma and and work on creating different patterns and things that you want in your life. Um, And all of the stuff is uh, on my website, including all of our merch for the, uh, the podcast FML talk, which I can't wait to have you on. Yay. I know me too. I can't wait. And we'll put all of that in the show notes in case you guys are driving. Don't worry. (laughs) It's in the show show notes, but man, you do some really great TikToks and and Instagrams. I just want to say. Thank you so much. Really I, I work really hard to show up authentically on there. Um, they sure are. <laughs> it really started. It really started when I was going on that Europe trip. I thought I was just going to get off social media and disconnect. And yeah. I posted one photo of me in my backpack kind of announcing my divorce because I hadn't been public about it. Oh, and wow. I got hundreds and hundreds of messages of people being like, oh my God, please keep sharing your journey. This like changed my day. It gave me hope. So I ended up like showing up on my Instagram 
uh, for days on my trip being like, I'm crying. This is terrible. Or like I'm partying. This is wonderful. Just in an authentic way that people could really see the journey. And I'm so glad I did that because every day now people go back and like all those photos as they're like reading along with it. So it's, oh my God, what a (laughs) journey. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you again. Your work is freaking incredible. I'm so happy to have you on today. Yeah. This is perfect for the new year. I know that this show is going to inspire a lot of people. So I'm so happy to hear it. And for anyone that's listening, that is going through something, I can promise you that no matter how dark it seems, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it is freaking magical. So keep going. Ooh, great. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Gabby. You're so welcome. 